In this episode of the Azure Essential Show, we're talking to two AI industry leaders about what we can expect in the next few years on this incredible AI journey. Let's get going. Welcome back to the uh, Azure Essential Show. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Jacob Benfeld. Uh, joining me today are Vijay Mittal, uh, Corporate Vice President and Chief AI Transformation Advisor at Microsoft Research, uh, and Uli Holman, uh, Corporate Vice President and Distinguished Architect in the Cloud and AI Business at Microsoft. Uh, in this episode, uh, which is part of our series on Essential AI for Businesses, uh, we are talking about uh, what's ahead of us, Gen AI uh, as a, a journey. Uh, so, Uli, Vijay, welcome back. Hey, Jacob, good to Thank see you. Jacob. Uh, good to see you. I've been working with foundational models since 2019. But I have to admit that even in early 2022, I could not have predicted the power of GPT. Guys, I'm wondering, in your opinion, what the next two to five years have in store for us. BJ, uh, this first question goes to you. So Jacob, exactly as you said, you know, two years ago, at least I could not, I don't think anyone could have predicted that uh, AI would be able to tell the difference between a limerick and a sonnet um, and inject humor into writing. So these are emergent properties and we know from biology that you know cells come together and one day they can start seeing. So we will be surprised. What I want to do is I want to pick out three areas that we know huge investment in AI is going into. And all these three things I would expect to see in most products, most services that are aiming to be radical innovations. So firstly, multi-step planning. So we're going to see agents and, and Uli described those a little earlier, so I'll hark back there where agents that have learned from how people use websites, documents, applications, and even communications, and how do they achieve larger goals? So now all this means that AI is capable or will become capable of actually achieving people's intent, not just giving them advice or giving them information, but actually achieving their ends. So that's the first one. So much more sophisticated products will now be offerable. Of course, it's got implications for what happens in internal business processes, but the products themselves can become more sophisticated. The second one is multimodality. You know, yes, text and images and video and speech, but gait and movement and air samples and, and, and you know, e even if, if we go to, to further out in vertical industries, ground penetrating radar and MRIs, all of these things we will get, these are modalities. So now you will get products all the way, to the one I referred to earlier, which is makeup applicators that are aware of the occasion as well as my skin condition and the proximity of other people, all the way down to products that adapt to electricity not perform, you know, working at the right voltage and things like adaptive products, we're going to see that. And the third one really is, is, is we're barely beginning to see this, which is moving from the digital world to the physical world. So one is understanding the behavior of the physical world, not just mechanics, but all the way down to molecular, and in some senses, some parts of quantum computing as well. How do atoms work with each other? And how do they behave when they form molecules? You know, How do they permeate membranes and so on? So we're going to see that. But we're also going to see systems that reach out into the physical world. Sure, sensing, but more than that, actuating things. We can call it robotics. We can call it materials that harden just before the point of impact. So these, I just cannot imagine new products, new innovations that will go out without these kinds of capabilities. So from transformation, I want to focus on the things that actually change what we aspire to. I guess what you're saying is that companies, enterprises, across industries uh, will be um, faced with uh, choices and challenges and, and opportunities and considerations uh, in ways that um, you know, they haven't been for, 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 for a number of years. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, a company that produces tablets 
and injections mm -hmm. will blur into therapies, into continuous care, into lifestyle. So you'll have to re-examine what is the business you're in or what's the business you can get into, which part of value chain. Yeah. Uh, this is incredibly exciting. Uh, Uli, any perspectives on your end? Yeah, I mean, again, I will harp down a little bit on the uh, governance side. As we all know, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, so for me, democratization of machine learning, operations, AI governance is something that um, is going to happen and has to be available for, as a foundation for us to move forward. Otherwise, it just doesn't really work. Uh, then you can also start to see this already. Co-pilots as applications to augment human capability started really on individual tasks. But you're now seeing these um, co-pilots merge to become much more team oriented and project oriented. So in the original uh, model for GitHub Copilot, for example, it was all about the individual developer. How do I help Jacob write a better piece of code? Mm -hmm. How do I help Jacob or Uli understand what is the piece of code? Now the system can do pull requests. Now the system can go and look at the entire project and do a security review and point out what are the security issues and so forth. So you will start to see the scope going from very narrow to very broad. Um, again, some folks refer that to repository level co-pilots that really understand the scope of an entire project or starting to understand even, let's say, a Microsoft Windows, which is a ginormous code base, and the system will start to understand what it is, how to work with it, and so forth. And then last but not least, we kind of talked a little bit about this already, is that the large language models, as the name said, are very large, but they're also expensive, uh, both in terms of energy usage as well as latency um, and so forth. So there's a ton of energy to go and make them run cheaper and not just cheaper in terms of cost, but cheaper in terms of latency to get to real time responses. So like you and I would chat, uh, now you can see with GPT-4.0, you can interrupt uh, the prompt and saying, hey, prompt, don't finish. I would like you to redirect uh, this piece. Yeah. Uh, and you also see that there's a lot of work going on to uh, make the system faster, cheaper, and less energy intensive, which obviously is important for the planet. And then the other dimension, which is uh, becoming really, really fast growing, is small language models. So effectively models that are very, very capable like our mm -hmm. Phi3 series of models, but that are now uh, embeddable into phones, into medical equipment, into robots in the factory, where I personally believe you will see the largest proliferation of AI is going to be in the embedded space. Uh, you will see effectively TVs having uh, AI built in, so you can talk to the system and you don't necessarily even need a remote anymore. Again, a lot of this has been tried before, but with two simple AI systems. Now with uh, the Gen AI wave, I think we can get to much more human interaction and much more complex systems. So I think it's a really great set of capabilities going from individual to teams to real corporate projects, thinking about governance in a holistic fashion, and then at the end of the day, distribute AI everywhere so that it can weave its magic and support human interaction, human ingenuity, wherever this activity takes place. Uh, Uli, this is fantastic. And, and before getting into my, my final question uh, to, to, to the two of you today, uh, Uli, just one comment on that is, uh, again, taking on the business hat for a second, if you have full fluidity, right, if you have the opportunity to, let's say, have very opinionated professional skeptics in, in high cognitive type domains, being able to reason uh, within the same uh, hypothesis building, I guess that also requires uh, C-suites to help drive that culture. Is, do, do you, do, would you agree with that? Yeah, so we talked about this before, that ultimately culture gets led from the top. Uh, Satya Nadella, our CEO, always says he really is the chief culture officer, not the chief executive officer, because culture sets the... Uh, path to success. Uh, Peter Drucker, I'm sure you guys uh, know this as well, has this nice saying that says, hey, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. 
Um, and so if you can't set the culture and the culture, the tone of the company, the way you think and work together set, is set from the top. If that does not happen, none of these advances really will land. There will be lots of enthusiastic people trying to work, but they don't get the support. They don't get the, uh, yeah, how do I say this, guardrails where they, how, how they are supposed to work that comes from the top. They won't be successful. Thank, thank, thank you, Uli. And let me close this session by asking, um, so what is your advice to enterprises that are taking a big bet on, on generative AI for uh, radical product innovation? I mean, how should they think about um, continuous advancements in, in Gen AI? What's the considerations? Uh, Vijay. So for me, there are two architecture and the one that Uli referred to, which is culture. Mm. So on the architecture side, an architecture that can evolve. New AI models can keep coming in, new data sources can keep coming in without any disruption. And most importantly, AI learns. So AI becomes better by feedback. So that's an evolution. We've never seen systems that know how to evolve or can be evolved. So that's the first part, architect for that, as opposed to this is exactly what we are looking for and the system does what we're looking for. On the culture side, it's a culture of curiosity, but cautious curiosity. Mm -hmm. Discover new things, but cross-check. Satisfy yourself. Compare the output of this new model with older AI or traditional calculator or a colleague so the key is to your ability to harness these advances mm -hmm. without waiting for some plateau of perfection or ubiquity that will come maybe many, many years down the road. But we are talking here about people who are involved in R&D, in product innovation, in radical transformation. And these are not people who are going to wait until that day, whatever that day is. Explore, explorers by nature. No, th thank you, Vijay. Uh, Uli, any uh, final um, consideration, thoughts on your end? Yeah, I mean, Vijay already pointed out the key points that I would have also said, uh, but I would add, think end to end. You can't just think one element, you have to think about the other aspects as well from the entire life cycle, think governance and so forth. We talked about this before, which I think is really important. The other half that I would push is VJ already mentioned, hey, start now, work with co-pilots, work with the capabilities that are out there. Um, I would echo that and say, add some long-term thinking to it. So understand what you can do today, but then keep, stay curious in terms of what's going on because AI is advancing fast and there's opportunities for radical product innovation in multi-agent thinking in small language models, in a science AI, for example. And if you're not engaging, you will miss out on those opportunities. And so innovative enterprises really are the ones that are taking, are willing to take risk and they are not waiting for everything to be perfect before they get moving. Um, and as uh, Vijay said, be enthusiastic and driving but balance with caution, because again, the thing is moving fast and sometimes you are going in a direction that ultimately is not the direction that the world, the rest of the world is showing. So you need to be able to pivot. You need to be able to evolve uh, without invalidating your entire architecture of your solutions and so forth. So I think there is a lot of um, excitement that I think people should have, but also a lot of, okay, how do we organize ourselves? How do we create an end-to-end -end model view? Um, and how do we work together between IT and the R&D folks to make this work end-to-end -end at scale? So really, can I just ask you, I know you do a lot of extreme sports and things that truly are exploration. Are there any lessons from that part of your lifestyle for, for these companies? Have a guide around is one of them, I would say. Whenever I go crazy, uh, do crazy stuff, I have a person that actually knows what he or she is doing, uh, where he or she is going. And therefore, I think um, partnering with organizations like Microsoft is a good strategy because we are looking ahead. We are involved in research and so forth. So that's um, one key thing. And then the other one is have the right equipment. 
uh, because if you go out there, uh, understand where you're going and be able to rely on the equipment that you're driving or using um, in order to go and be confident that you will make it to wherever the destination is. I learned quite a lot from that as well. I absolutely love that analogy. Th thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Vijay. Uh, thank you, Uli, for your time today. Uh, and for our viewers, uh, if you have questions or, or comments about today's topic, uh, be sure to add them below and we uh, will get back to you. Thank you for watching the Asher uh, Essential Show. Vijay, uh, Uli, thank you again. An absolute pleasure. Absolutely. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Thank you, guys.